one of the leading experts on internationalization of higher education, has visited UNESP. Professor Hans de Witt is the director of the Center for International Higher Education at the Boston College in the United States. Professor Hans de Witt was also an advisor for UNESP's internationalization plan, which was developed as part of UNESP's project within the CAP Sprint program. The expert from the Boston College spent a few days meeting with the project steering committee. During this period, we had the opportunity to hear from Professor Hans de Witt his vision of the internationalization of UNESP and the Brazilian universities. I'm Hans de Witt, I'm professor of international higher education and also director of the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College in the United States, uh, a center that focuses on understanding higher education in the global context. What are the main challenges and uh, developments in higher education working in an international environment? Mobility of students, mobility of scholars, uh, internationalization of the curriculum and teaching and learning. So all international dimensions we try to research and to publish about and teach about. Okay, and based on that, uh, how do you evaluate uh, Brazilian policies for the internationalization of uh, higher education? Well, Brazil has, over the past 10 years, been a very interesting case of the challenges and the opportunities, uh, the importance of federal uh, support for internationalization in the world. Uh, the Science Without Border program, in particular, uh, attracted a lot of attention around the world about a new way of thinking about how you can internationalize higher education in a country by uh, at that time focusing uh, on we have to send our undergraduate and graduate students abroad for shorter periods of uh, experience uh, and we hope that by bringing their experience back we can also modernize higher education in Brazil and in itself a very fascinating experiment uh, which had some errors in it which with hindsight uh, uh, you could learn from uh, like there was this focus on only uh, the top institutions around the world so uh, it didn't really stimulate south-south cooperation uh, the language was a serious issue because uh, um, there was supposed that most students would be capable to go to other countries in other languages, but the majority of the students at the end went to Portugal or to Spain uh, because of language limitations. Uh, and also, it was seen by, in particular, the developed world as a kind of income generation because they charged tuition fees. And there was not really an institutional uh, basis for cooperation as part of the Science Without Borders. So, uh, in itself, it was a good initiative and uh, you had to learn lessons from it and that's what they did with the new program Carpa Sprint uh, to say well it has to be much more an institutional approach you have to focus much more on collaboration with other partners around the world and you have also at least allow 30 percent of your uh, partnerships and relations not being in the main english-speaking world uh, that doesn't mean that there are still challenges also with the Carpus Sprint program in the sense that uh, it's still much dominated by the English language. Uh, so even if students go to uh, China or if they go to India, or well, India is English, but it's not a good example, but if they go to Portugal or if they go to France, they still have to know uh, a very high level of English. And that limits the possibilities. Uh, and also it makes English too much of a dominant language of uh, communication in the world and ignoring the increasing importance of other languages uh, for communication and higher education. But overall, I think the intentions with uh, the change from Science Without Borders to Carpus Sprint, also the focusing much more on postgraduate than undergraduate, was a good decision by the previous government to do. What the main challenge now is uh, also is the reduction of funding uh, in the current economic crisis and also the lack of investment in higher education. And, and you were part of uh, a UNESP committee for uh, UNESP uh, CAP Sprint project. In the last few days you've been uh, talking about the UNESP project for the CAP Sprint program. How do you evaluate it? What do you think that are the main challenges for UNESP in, 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 within this program? 
Well, there the are several challenges. Uh, some are external, but that's the limitations that the CAPES print uh, imposes on UNESP uh, to do things like, uh, I mentioned the English language program, the budget restrictions, uh, the short-term uh, calls, so there's not much time for preparation uh, on those kind of things. So there's some bureaucratic measures which every program has. So uh, uh, that's a challenge from external. Internal, I think it is still the challenge that, uh, like many institutions do, you want to keep everybody happy. So there's not focus, there's not a prioritization, there's not a clear uh, identification of key performance indicators and outcomes. Uh, and by that, uh, there is a high risk that uh, you, at the end, don't get clear results. So the discussions that we had over the past two days is how can we focus? How can we make clear uh, identified outcomes? How can we combine the different components, the sandwich doctoral program, the young talent and postdoc program, and the network program into one call? so that they are much more related to each other and much more focused uh, to make it much more effective for the future of uh, UNESP uh, in, uh, in the areas and the thematic fields that they have identified. And uh, what are the positive aspects of the project? The positive aspects are that uh, by having this support uh, of funding, by having these calls, you stimulate your researchers and your young talents and uh, doctoral and postgraduate students uh, to really uh, to identify the possibilities of collaboration with uh, other institutions around the world and to know and understand uh, much better how you can improve your quality of your research, your quality of your education by collaborating with uh, colleagues in different parts of the world. And nowadays we see that there's a lot of attention given to rankings, international rankings, university rankings. Uh, uh, is that a good criteria to establish partnerships, rankings? Uh, if not, uh, what would be the best criteria to establish partnerships? The best criteria, in my view, are not so much rankings. Rankings uh, are uh, a certain indication of quality, but it is an indication of quality by external uh, uh, rankers and uh, you have to build quality on your own strengths and your own specialities. Uh, so uh, I am not a big fan of identifying uh, collaboration and scholarships on exclusively on rankings. Uh, in particular not if it is institutional rankings because institutional rankings don't identify uh, the quality of certain disciplines and areas and teams. So uh, at least subject areas rankings have a better uh, focus on what is possible. Because you would exclude very good scholars and very good research teams in not highly ranked institutions uh, uh, if you focus only on the institutional ranking. So my view, uh, what is most important is what are the contributions by collaborating with other institutions to improve the quality of what you're doing in your research? What can it do to contribute to the development of the, the country and uh, the local community? That should be much more a driving uh, uh, incentive than uh, the rankings themselves. And well, Brazil has been experiencing a shortage of investments in education and science. And how does this affect uh, international policies and how can we overcome this, this issue? Well, it is. Uh, certainly true that uh, the country is facing very big chances in the, the support for, for higher education, for research. And uh, we know that uh, from all our work that we do in higher education around the world, that uh, in the knowledge economy we are living in, higher education research is essential for the development of uh, the countries. Only in that way you can really uh, develop the, the economy, you can develop society, you can address uh, critical issues for the country. So, in general, a short is a cut in, in, in support for higher education and research is in the long run very negative for a country's development. So, and if given the complexity of the issues that we have in society, international collaboration in research and in teaching is an important part of 
uh, this whole knowledge economy. So if you cut on those aspects as well, then in the long run it will have a negative uh, impact. And what we see, not only in Brazil, but we see it in the United States, we see it in Hungary, we see it in, uh, in other countries, uh, that increasingly there's a short-term uh, policy with respect to higher education. They think that uh, it doesn't impact. Uh, so let's cut them because uh, we don't need them. But they, because governments in general have a short thinking time because until the next elections and uh, they don't have a long-term perspective. And that's very dangerous for a country if it happens. And, and there's also a, a problem that uh, the, the, the lack of investment may force uh, researchers to go abroad looking for better opportunities. Some people call it uh, brain, drain, brain drain, which in Portuguese we call uh, fuga de cérebros. Uh, my question is, is, is brain drain like a side effect of uh, internationalization? And how can we avoid this, this uh, the living of researchers to other countries and outside uh, Brazilian universities? Certainly brain drain is a potential side effect of internationalization when it is done in the wrong way. If you, if you send your students abroad uh, with the idea that they, can, uh, they don't have to come back, uh, but they can work for their personal interest. And that's understandable. I mean, if you can get a better job abroad and there's no availability of jobs in your own country when you have been studying for uh, higher qualifications, then it's, why, why would you stay? Uh, so what you have to do is uh, focus on uh, stimulating uh, students to get the experience abroad, but give them the facilities to operate in their own country by uh, giving more job opportunities, by uh, giving them uh, the possibility to have good infrastructure for research, by uh, making them uh, feel welcome at home again. Uh, all those kind of aspects are important. Uh, and many countries have programs to really to stimulate uh, students to go uh, back home by giving them extra support in, uh, in getting jobs and career development in the home country. But brain drain is in itself not as bad as it is uh, used in a different way. So we, we even sometimes call it now brain circulation. If students go from one country to the other and then do another de uh, degree or job in another country, that can be positive because they bring by that uh, knowledge to, uh, about Brazil uh, to the other countries. They also can create networks and cooperation where they are working with Brazilian higher education. So diaspora uh, uh, is, uh, can be in a very important contribution also to the development of the country and the higher education system. Nowadays we are living uh, a moment <clears throat> that we have uh, 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 um, growing uh, idea anti of uh, anti-globalization. Uh, we have some uh, leaders, uh, nation leaders that go against uh, globalization, that criticize globalization. Uh, you know that globalization and internationalization of higher education are different things, but do you think that these anti-globalization ideas can affect somehow internationalization of, of universities? It, it can, and the United States is a clear example of that, that you see that the number of students coming to the United States is decreasing during the, the current Trump administration, uh, where Canada, which has a much more welcoming policy of uh, uh, has an enormous increase of students. We see in the UK that Brexit has a negative impact on immigration of international students. So there's certainly a relationship. But also uh, we have to analyze as higher education institutions why is this happening. We have become maybe a little bit of too isolated of the local society. We have become too much of an ivory tower of elitist uh, intellectuals who are connected to the rest of the world, but without having seen what, uh, what happens with the local community. Uh, because there is a reason why people vote for Donald Trump or for your president or for other ones. Uh, it's not because they are uh, in themselves so anti-international, anti-immigration, but they are feeling that they are disconnected from what is happening in the world. So we have much more adapt our international uh, activities to 
how can we benefit local development? How can we develop local communities? So we have to learn from that. And by that we have to change our curriculum and our teaching and learning also in K-12 to better understand that uh, local issues are connected to the global and global issues can help the local development. And we have forgotten about that. So we have to learn our lessons as well from what is happening currently around the world. Okay, uh, is anything else that you'd like to say? Uh... No, I like to say th only that I, I thank UNESP for uh, inviting me to be part of this advisory of a committee for uh, UNESP uh, governance imprint because uh, I think I can, f by being an outsider with an international experience, contribute, but also I can learn a lot from how the discussions are happening here at UNESP and. Uh, uh, I am very positive about at least the way uh, the institution is trying to very much involve uh, into the international environment, uh, even in this difficult time. And uh, uh, the international operation of UNESP are worldwide known because of its activities, uh, thanks to people like uh, Jose Celso. Uh, and uh, I think that shows also that UNESP has uh, a good contribution to the international environment. Okay, thank you very much for the interview. Have a good time in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you.